this whole thing about people being slain in the spirit real or not? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the broadcast. Michael Brown, delighted to be here with you. I believe you're going to be edified, helped, equipped, strengthened. That's our goal every day, to infuse you with faith and truth and courage to help you stand strong on the front lines. Here's the number to call to get in the broadcast. As long as you want to talk about the things of the Spirit or criticism of the things of the Spirit, that's what we'll be talking about today, the reality of the power of the Spirit, the phenomenon of being slain in the Spirit, real or not. That's our topic, 866 888-7884. As I speak outside our studio, we're getting closer to the solar eclipse. Just looked outside with glasses a few minutes ago and still bright outside and the eclipse partially happening. But if the world ends during the broadcast, then I will see you in the world to come. And if you're not ready for the world to come, good time to cry out and get right with God now. Is there a connection between the solar eclipse and Israel being under pressure from America to pull out of southern Gaza with their troops? Maybe we'll discuss that Thursday. I've got a new article up. It'll be on different sites about should we pay any attention to the red heifers, etc. So we'll be talking about that. Another article I wrote refuting Dr. Gary DeMar saying that replacement theology is a hoax. So a lot of uh, information we've got coming out for your articles, different things. We'll be pointing you to the links in the days ahead. 866-348-7884. First question is, why in the world are we talking about people being slain in the spirit? I mean, isn't that like decades old issue and either you believe in it, or you don't believe in it? Well, in recent months, there has been fresh controversy about cessationism versus continuationism. Fresh controversy over the question of, do the New Testament gifts like prophecy, like healing, continue today? Are they normative? Or are claims today and around the world and for the last 100 plus years, claims that these things continue, are they bogus? Should these things be expected? Are they normative? Is it, is it really God? Is it the flesh? Is it the devil? So. Even though God's moving powerfully, wonderfully all over the world, I'm an eyewitness to it in 200 trips outside of the United States, over 200 trips outside of the United States. I'm an eyewitness to what the Holy Spirit's doing in America. I'm an eyewitness to what he's been doing in my own life for over 50 years. And to me, it's black and white plain that scripture says these things will continue until Jesus returns. There is fresh attack on this. So we're we're responding to this as I'm known as a charismatic leader or charismatic theologian, often the attack will come my way, and I I do my best to engage critics. Many don't do that. They don't feel it's their calling, or they feel, hey, I've got my flock. I've got those that God's called me to minister to. I'm going to minister to them and build them up and strengthen them and not worry about those and attack and criticize. Others say, hey, we're not attacking and criticizing. We're just doing the right thing and putting out the truth. They're in their lane, and often neither lane intersects. I often try to engage and intersect. It can get messy and get ugly, but the goal is to try to help the body grow. The goal is let's listen to each other, let's learn from each other, let's strengthen each other, and and let's see everything that Jesus wants to do for his glory through his people on the earth today. And if God is really moving, we want to embrace it. If it's something counterfeit, we want to reject it. So what do we make of this? People falling under the Spirit's power. Where is that in the Bible? That's the first question that people ask. This is something that's become a normative practice. Where is it in the Bible? So my question would be the other question. Where is it spoken against in the Bible? Where does God warn against it? Where does Scripture say this is something that we should avoid? You say, yeah, but we've got to be very, very careful. Okay, so here's a great principle from Jonathan Edwards. By all means, we test the spirits. By all means, 100%. But we use the word of God according to the word of God. Not according to your standard of mind, but according to the word of God. And Jonathan Edwards, considered to be America's greatest philosopher and theologian, 
used powerfully by God in the Great Awakening in the 1730s and 1740s in America, Jonathan Edwards famously said to the critics of revival in his day, we ought not to limit God where he hath not limited himself. And he said that the Bible nowhere tells us to use the Bible to judge, well, this person shook, this person fell, this person wept, this person, whatever. He said, the Bible nowhere tells us to judge by those things. Rather, you judge by overall scriptural truth is the message that accompanies this according to scripture and is the effect of this alleged work of the spirit on someone's life positive? Does it lead them to Jesus? Does it lead them to the truth? Does it lead them to the word? Does it lead it to holiness? If so, it's from God because the devil cannot do it and would not do it. His house would be divided against himself if he led people to the Jesus of the Bible, to holiness, to the word of God. And the flesh can't do it. So if someone has an alleged spiritual experience and says God really touched them, as a result of which they turn away from sin, as a result of which they love the Jesus of the scriptures, as a result of which they follow the Lord passionately all the days of their lives and preach the word and bring the lost to, to, to him. Well, that was God. That was the Holy Spirit who did the work. It's very, very simple. And you say, well, why do people fall over? Well, the sophisticated theological explanation goes like this. It's because they can't stand up. They're overcome and overwhelmed by the Spirit's power and presence. And that is a biblical precedent. Well, if it's really God, they'll fall forward. Okay, where does the Bible actually give us that principle? If it's really God, they'll fall forward as opposed to fall back. Well, the only ones that fell backward are in one place, and that's in judgment. Okay. Where, where's the Bible giving that as these are the norms, this is how you judge? As Jonathan Edwards said, if that was the purpose of Scripture, then God will tell the shepherds, this is how you judge. This is how you evaluate. Look at the heartbeat. Look at the pupils that are getting the eyes smaller, larger. But the Bible doesn't tell us to judge by that. Plus, everyone responds and reacts differently. And over the years, I've prayed for thousands of people and seen them fall flat on their face and others fall on their back. And I've seen them touched equally the same way. So, again, it's such an odd thing to me that people will get in an uproar over this. You know, send me a video. How can this, you call this person a brother? Look, all these people falling as he's ministering. That's supposed to mean they're not a brother. There's, that's supposed to mean they're not saved. That's supposed to mean they're guilty of some fanaticism or emotionalism. Sh show me, show me just here. I'm a, Bible, I'm a board person. I'm a Bible person, like many of you. Show me in the Bible where it says judge by the, yeah, test the spirits. How? Well, you look, biggest thing, you look at doctrine, if doctrine's not the issue, if Jesus is being preached, the Jesus of the Bible, if he's being preached, then you look at the effect it has on someone's life. Very simple. So I, I asked a question on, on Facebook. Anyone can fall, anyone can fall over. And remember, in the late 70s and the early 80s, I rejected being slain in the spirit. I actually had a little teaching against it, that it proves nothing, anybody can fall. And I had like five points and why it's not from God. Okay, so I, even though I had prayed for people before and seen the power of God touch them and they fell over, all right? And it wasn't like, it wasn't a common thing, but you'd see it here and there and it seemed very genuine when it happened. I rejected it for a number of years. I was skeptical and, and, and I had all my reasons, but I, I actually couldn't quote scripture to that effect. I couldn't quote the Bible to that effect. And then over the years I've prayed and I've seen the power of God come in dramatic ways. And, and way, you have to understand, you have to understand, I've been in meetings where someone's getting prayer, right? So I'm, I'm walking down an aisle to leave a building. So I am walking behind people in the aisle. So they're standing there, eyes closed, being prayed for. I'm walking behind them. Someone's been praying for them for a few minutes, hand on their forehead, quietly praying. They don't know I'm behind them. They don't hear I'm behind them. I'm not saying anything, but I just have to get by them. I barely put my hand on their back, boom, and they fall over. Why, why, how'd that happen? Why'd that happen? I prayed for people that didn't believe it that were skeptics. I'm just going to shake their hand, and the power of God's hit them, and they fell to the ground, and God up changed. How'd that happen? Where was the power of suggestion? I've, I've been in circles where no one had ever seen it, and I, I, 
I wasn't expecting anything. Didn't say a word about falling. Began to pray for leaders on the platform. They began to fall on their face, fall on their side, fall on their back. And people were shocked. They'd never seen it. Well, where'd that come from? And, and when they got up changed, having encountered the Lord, who did that? So I want you to hear some testimonies. And I want to ask you the question, who did this? Who was responsible for this? Was this genuinely the Holy Spirit? Was it the flesh? So suggestion or just getting worked up? Or was it the devil? All right, so let me, let me read a few. I posted on Facebook and said, I realize anybody can fall, but have you had a genuine life-changing experience being, quote, slain in the spirit? We got hundreds of, of responses. But let me, let me read a few for you. This one is from Paula. Paula says this, Dr. Brown, you pointed at me from about seven feet away at the altar at Brownsville. I fell to the floor on my stomach. Oh, she fell on her face. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to get stepped on or I need to get up. I could not. There was a huge hand on my back. I don't know how long I was on the floor, but when I got up and went to my pew, electricity, love, joy, peace shot through me for about an hour. I laughed and shook. I have never been the same. I love, I mean, I truly love Jesus. God has placed evangelism into me 37 years ago. And it's still here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being so mightily used by the Lord during that amazing revival. So here's someone, didn't even touch. She has this powerful experience, overcome, and she's telling you 37 years later, the fruit is still there. She loves Jesus, and he put evangelism in her heart, and she's still burning for the lost. Was that the flesh? Did she just get worked up? Did I like <laughs> do something like and point it and tricked her? Or, or was, it, was it the devil who did that and gave her this love for Jesus and love for the lost? Or was it the Holy Spirit? I, I got a bunch more to read to you. I mean, we go on for months or years just reading testimonies like this. But I want you to recognize, friends, you'll judge the tree by the fruit. And the fruit is not a fanatical clip of one person or some demonic fundraising. The fruit is hundreds, thousands, millions powerfully touched living for Jesus today. Don't side against the Holy Spirit because he works in ways you're not used to. Don't grieve the Spirit. Instead, rejoice in what he's doing. This is Michael Ellison, founder of Tribeta Wellness. I want you to hear an amazing testimony from my friend, James Robison, and most all of you will know of him. He and his wife, Betty, host the Life Today television program. Now here is James. Let me tell you about a miracle I experienced. My friend, Michael Ellison, he and his wife are our 40 year plus best friends. Well, let me just say this to you. I had so much pain with what was called tennis elbow that I could hardly reach over and pick up the phone without pain, without it hurting me. I couldn't pick up something to drink, a glass of tea or anything. It was very difficult to do anything without wearing a tight strap. And then Michael shared the nopal cactus juice with me, nopalea. I began drinking about that much in the morning in a glass and that much later in the day. And in three months, I was a different person. I have now gone more than 10 years with no pain. Not better, well, I have no joint pain. I'm telling you, it did something to the inflammation in my body that was undeniable. Now, that's just my testimony. But that's been more than 10 years with no pain. Matter of fact, if I miss for some foolish reason a few days, I can feel it creeping back that fast. So give it a try. See if it helps relieve your pain. I hope it does like it has mine because it worked for me. No Pelea is supported by clinical studies for lowering inflammation and improving mobility, flexibility, and range of motion in the neck, back, and joints for less reliance on pain medication and improved quality of life. Call 800-771-5584 and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order goes to support the line of fire. 
Call 800-771-5584 or go online to Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Shout out to our co-sponsor, Trivita, for their great wellness products and their generous support of this ministry. I enjoy the wellness products, and we are so blessed to be on so many stations with the help of Trivita. Check out these great health resources for yourself, 800-771-5584. Folks, I'd love to answer your questions, too, so call in with your questions, and they'll tell you what will work best, 800-771-5584 or Trivita.com, Trivita.com, and then use the code BROWN25. By the way, uh, seize the moment, how to fuel the fires of revival from Revival to Reformation, book one. This came out early this year, and in less than one month, Turn the Tide, the sequel, from Revival to Reformation, book two, How to Ignite a Cultural Awakening. We'll tell you how you can pre-order your signed copy a little bit later in the broadcast. We'll let you know how to do that. By the way, it's my joy for all, you know, every self and we'll see comments is all about the money. You do it all for the money. So every book we sell through this ministry, from the history of the ministry, I don't make a dime on Every book we sell that goes through, through uh, you, you pre-order, you order through our website, or I'm out preaching, we have a book table, that all, that all goes back into ministry, all of it, 100%. Other ministers do the same. It's not it's some big thing I'm doing, but they'll be, you're not doing it all for money. It's like, actually, it all goes right back into ministry. We'd sell 10 million of these, doesn't go in my pocket. Anyway, praise God. So uh, let, me, let me read some more testimonies for you. This one is from Matthew. 866-34-TRUTH. You want to blast me? You want to differ with me? All those that attack me on our YouTube channel and our Facebook pages, call. I'm a nice guy. We have a friendly conversation. 866-348-7884. So again, asking the question, were you ever, quote, slain in the spirit? What impact did it have on your life? Matthew, you have no idea. And I don't do courtesy drops for anyone. I pastored a church in upstate New York and still do. You laid your hand on my stomach at the Brownsville Revival in 1997. The days when you and John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill went around the sanctuary praying for whoever was in front of you, you quietly said, fire. And I flew about two to three feet and landed under a pew and didn't know what hit me or how it happened because of the crowds. As you know, we're, we're stifling and falling was a chore due to the, to the press to quote the New Testament. In other words, there's so many people around, there was hardly any room to, to fall down. This was my first time, quote, being slain. My life and then church was radically and unimaginably changed forever. That sounds like Jesus to me. That sounds like the Holy Spirit to me. Again, I'm, I'm just reading samples. I pulled a few of these last night. Bonnie, yes, in 1996 at Brownsville Church, a lost religious Baptist woman was slain in the spirit. And when I got up, there was a love and hunger for God that hasn't changed. I know some of you have a hard time with this because it's outside your paradigm, but God is often outside our paradigm. And if it's not against, if it's not spoken against in the word, there's a difference between unbiblical meaning it's contrary to the Bible, contrary to the word, and extra biblical, meaning it's not explicitly mentioned in the word. And the idea of people being overpowered by the presence of God is certainly a common concept in the word. Emilio, when you prayed for me in Brownsville, you know what's interesting, all these Brownsville testimonies, this means they're over 25 years old and the people are still talking about how they're changed. Emilio, when you prayed for me in Brownsville, Pensacola, I flew backwards and it launched me into a great move of God at my church in Manson, Washington. And notice all these people saying how they, they, they flew, they, they got hit. In other words, I, I'm just going up to someone either pointing in their direction or putting my hand on the stomach if it's a guy or just touching their a woman's head. And the, when the power of God hits and people testify to being thrown in the air, it's, I wasn't doing it. I remember once 
Nancy had said to me that there were, you know, I prayed for a friend of ours who was a worship leader, very sensitive guy, just great, great soul. And, and he was, he said to Nancy, you know, Mike was a little rough when he prayed for me. And I said, honey, I, I barely got near him. So the next night, I remember she was just walking, praying in the balcony, praying in the spirit, and I'm praying for people. And he's standing there, eyes closed. So I just I got her attention. Are you watching? And I barely got my finger, barely to his stomach, barely touched. Boom, and he fell to the ground, touched beautifully by the power of God. I looked at her, it's like, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. Craig, yes, my first semester at CFNI in 1997, on the floor for two hours, Holy Spirit convicting me of things I prioritized above him, still marked to this day by that encounter. Who did that? That's not the work of the devil convicting us by the Spirit and changing us. That's not the work of the flesh. That's not the work of emotionalism because emotionalism doesn't bring about lasting change. And you have person after person talking about the lasting change that came in their lives or how moves of the Spirit broke out in their churches. A few more. Liz, yes. Last year, for months on end, I battled depression and a spirit of fear. Finally, during one Sunday morning service, a dear elderly lady of God came and laid her hands on my head while I was weeping at the altar. She commanded the spirit of fear to leave me, and as soon as she did, I felt my body go limp. I sank to the floor. I could literally feel that spirit lift off of me. I sank to the floor and wept in relief and joy. From that moment on, I've not battled it again. Come on, you should be praising God by now. Donna. Yes, once. I'm a Baptist lady who had certainly read about it a lot, but skeptical as to it being genuine. What a surprise to experience it. Of all places, I was in Jerusalem on tour with Michael Brown in 2014. I won't go into the whole story, but I remember Dr. Brown barely touching the top of my head. Next thing I knew, I was coming to on my face on the floor. Almost a half hour had gone by and I was out. I was filled with such peace, love, and thankfulness. When I returned home, I was much more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Things just happened, more answered prayers, speaking in tongues followed. I'm so thankful to realize a deeper relationship with our Lord. Who did that? That was Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Pharaoh, I did. I was a committed Muslim and had no idea what slain in the Spirit was. The power of God came over me in a church service, knocked me down, and had me out for about 20 minutes. After I could stand on my feet, I realized that I had been delivered, saved, and healed. From that day on, I was never the same again. This was 32 years ago. Since then, I have pastored and planted churches and continue serving him today as a missionary. Jesus is Lord. (laughs) The only way he's saying that is by the Spirit, friends. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, you cannot make that true profession of faith, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. And it's the spirit who touched him. And as a Muslim, he had an encounter with God and was slain in the spirit. Alan, sure have. The very first time I had decided it wasn't going to happen to me, I was adamant about it. Sat in the back row with my arms belligerently folded across my chest. Somehow the Holy Spirit had other ideas. And before I knew it, I found myself up front and laid out on the altar, unable to move. I had no option but to lay there and to listen to what the Lord had to tell me. My life has never been the same. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're just basing things on experience. No, I'm basing things on biblical principles, that the Holy Spirit moves powerfully, touches lives, and that when it's genuinely the Holy Spirit, he will lead people to Jesus. That's what the Bible tells me. The Bible doesn't tell me to make a judgment based on whether someone falls or shakes or jumps or shouts or lays their emotions, doesn't tell me to make a judgment on any of that. Read it cover to cover. I have many times. It doesn't say that. It does say to look at the fruit of the tree. Has the person turned away from sin? Has the person turned to Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible? Are they submitting to the word of God? Do they have a burden for the lost? Are they leading godly lives? That's the Holy Spirit. You should rejoice in what God is doing. And if it shifts your paradigm, so be it. So be it. We are all growing. Accept what God is doing rather than reject and mock and laugh at it. And if your response to this is to put some video clip of some crazy meeting up, you really don't know the Holy Spirit that well. I say that from the heart. Hey, 
Hey friends, Michael Brown here. My delight to serve as your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. We are living in such urgent times today, friends, that all of us are in the line of fire. There's a target on your back. There's a target on my back. If you simply seek to live by biblical values or just conservative moral values, you could be canceled. You could be cast out. You could be put down. You could be silenced. I'm here to say, friends, that I am not about to be silenced, and I don't believe you are either. It is time for us to stand up. It is time for us to say enough is enough. It is time for us to push back in Jesus' name, not fighting the way the world fights. No, overcoming evil with good, overcoming hatred with love, overcoming the flesh with the power of the Spirit, overcoming lies with truth. And that's what we're here to do on the Line of Fire broadcast. And friends, it's not just a broadcast. It is a movement of people around the world, God's people standing up saying enough is enough and saying, Lord, here we are. Send us, use us. I want to urge you today to join our support team because we are on the front lines together. And we are literally touching people around the world, in America, in the nations, in Israel. And together with your help, we're going to amplify this voice and spread this movement around the globe. So... I encourage you, go right now to thelineoffire.org, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support. When you do, you become a torchbearer. We immediately send you two great life-changing books. We immediately give you access to many classes I've taught. Others have to pay to take those. You get them for free exclusive video audio content, a new audio message every month, an insider prayer newsletter, 15% discount on our online bookstore, so much more. Join our support team today. Go to thelineoffire.org. Donate monthly. This is how we rise up. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. That is the number to call, 866-34-TRUTH. Okay, three quick announcements. Do you know about Not Ashamed of Jesus Day, April 14th, in the spirit of Esther 414? You've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. It's a time when maybe people that you work with, you didn't know they were believers, they're going to identify themselves that day as believers. Maybe at school you, you bring your Bible with you, you wear a Jesus T-shirt, Whatever you can do that's, that's allowed, you know, you may have a dress code at your school and you, you can't dress differently, but maybe you bring a Bible or you go out of your way to share your testimony with someone. It's just a day for us to shout out to the world, we're here. Because many times folks don't even know that neighbor, that person, that coworker, that you're believers, there's an encouragement with it. And then for some who've been a little shy to let it be known that you're a follower of Jesus, this is the day to put it out and to say, hey, this is... I'm here. I'm a believer. It's also a great time for people. To, you say, hey, do you need prayer for anything? I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe they don't know that. So go to notashamedofjesus.org. Notashamedofjesus.org. In fact, I'll make that announcement now. Two more. I'll give them a little later to break it up. Notashamedofjesus.org. Spread the word. Spread the word on social media. Post things on your social media. Let's help get the word out. All right? And let's make a real impact this year. Um, let me read one more testimony to you. This is from Billy Humphrey. Billy is a pastor and leads a house of prayer in Atlanta. Uh, he's interacting in, in his book on Reclaiming Revival with Corey Russell, uh, another uh, ministry leader. I wrote the forward to the book. So here's Billy's story. Dr. Brown is a good friend of mine today. Back then, I only knew him as Michael Brown, the teacher at the Browns Revival. My friend Ryan and I were in a meeting one time, and we were specifically wanting Dr. Brown to pray for us. He was at the entrance of the sanctuary and walking out into the lobby area, laying hands on people who were gathering around him. The lobby and the sanctuary were crowded with hundreds of people, yet we could see Dr. Brown laying hands on people, and they were flying into the air. I'm talking two or three feet as if they were being thrown. Friends, I've seen it with my own eyes, and I feel it when it happens. And plenty of times I pray for people and nothing outward happens, and I because I, I understand God's doing certain things in certain ways, and it's his sovereign will. He turns it on, he turns it off. But what they're describing, I've seen endlessly with my own eyes. Billy says, Ryan and I saw Dr. Brown coming our way. We knew it wasn't about the man, but about how the Lord was using Dr. Brown to touch people with his power. Dr. Brown was just a conduit. 
The people around us were getting delivered, healed, touched, and charged as God's power was breaking out in the building. We were desperate for God's presence, but as Dr. Brown got closer to us, the presence of God was increasing to a level that began to strike a bit of holy fear in us. It was getting intense. Between that and the bodies flying as he neared us, the fear of the Lord began to radically intensify. So, friends, that's what happens when God's really moving. Often the fear of God comes with it. I thought, oh no, what did I get myself into? God's presence was bearing down on us. The air was heavy. The Lord was moving in like a massive giant lumbering our way. A collision felt inevitable. Then, pow, as Dr. Brown put one finger on Ryan, the spirit of hit him like he'd been shot with a gun. Ryan fell back several feet shouting, oh, and I was thinking, how do I get out of this? Next thing I knew, Dr. Brown had his hand on my head and said, fire. Into the air I went, up and back until bang, I hit the ground. I finally, to, finally came to sometime later, just like people in the Bible falling down as if they're dead. And then the, the angel or the Lord would say, hey, come on, get up, get up. He says this. Uh, I looked up and realized I was 10 to 15 feet away from where I had been when Dr. Brown had first laid his finger on me. Sitting there, I tried to make sense of what had just happened to me. I felt something like an electrical current shooting through me and coursing all over my body. I realized in that moment that God was much more powerful, much more present, much more available than I had ever known before. Here's the point. When God makes himself known, there's no question about it. And when he touches our hearts in a dynamic way during revival, he marks us. He expands our vision to see something transcendent, something beyond human ability to express. We will see him. We will see his power and glory. And we are wrecked for being satisfied with anything else. So as a result of this encounter, he wants to see God move more. He's got a greater vision for who God is, and it's carried with him all these many years since. So again, I remind you of what Jonathan Edwards said. We ought not to limit God where he hath not limited himself. And if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you will expect unusual things. You will expect supernatural things. You will expect the hand of God at work because it was normative in Bible days and is supposed to be normative throughout history. When it's not normative, it's because the church is not where it is supposed to be in one way or another. The Exodus, that was a one-time event. Elijah calling down fire from heaven on Mount Sinai. That was a one-time event. He calls down fire and judgment subsequently, but that event where he calls down fire on the sacrifices, one-time event. Or Jesus rising from the dead, never to die again. That's a one-time event until we're all resurrected. And we don't have any examples of the apostles turning water into wine. We don't have examples of anyone successfully walking on water. We know Peter tries to and then begins to sink. All right? But there are other things that continue as normative in the book of Acts, the healing of the sick driving out of demons, prophetic words, the Holy Spirit being poured out, supernatural signs and wonders, trances, visions, dreams, that continues to be normative, my friend. I, I want to read something to you. Tell me what you make of this. If you're skeptical about God speaking and acting today outside of just the Bible's preached, Jesus saves people, sanctifies them, is, is, there, is there anything... Beyond that, that the spirits do, I say, of course, day and night, day and night around the world. And it grieves me when people mock it. It grieves me when people reject it. It grieves me for them. It grieves me if they're my brothers and sisters and they're missing out on what God's doing. And when I've been in the midst of sacred moves of God, where people's lives are forever changed and Jesus is exalted, and then people mock it, it doesn't hurt me. It hurts me for them. It hurts me, it hurts me because it grieves the Lord. And because it mocks what, what the Holy Spirit's doing. Isn't that something major? Isn't that something we should be calling out? Those who deny what the Holy Spirit's doing today? Isn't that an issue that should concern us as well? So here's one of our workers, Fabian, uh, from the island of Malta, in Iraq, preaching Jesus in mosques. And he's actually done that with his team on about three occasions and then just ministering to Muslims day and night in, in other ways and seeing amazing fruit. So this is the testimony of an Iraqi Muslim Kurd just from a few days back. 
two Muslim background believers, so believers who are formerly Muslims, whom we are discipling and attending our discipleship school, went on an errand and they walked into a bookstore. Now, Fabian is a spiritual son. He and his wife, Carol, graduate from our ministry school. The colleague David, other colleagues there, their spouses, people we know well, known for years, okay? So this is not some account that somebody sent me that they heard from somewhere else who someone read about. So, no, no, this, this people are first-hand testimony, okay? So these two believers, formerly Muslim, uh, now in, uh, in their discipleship school, they went on an errand and they walked into a bookstore. They gave the store owner, an Iraqi Kurd, a Bible. And his response was, is this the book? Something strange is happening. Then he told them they had three dreams. In the first dream, he was in a restaurant and everyone was eating together a, a human body. He got closer and someone told them, this is the body of Christ. In the dream, he could see in the news the report about these people who were eating, quote, human body. And the reporter said, even when we try to stop them, these people will continue to eat him. Then the dream continued. He saw a hill, and on the hill was a staff, a crown, and a white robe. Then a person told him, these belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you have to eat my body, drink my blood, speaking spiritually, metaphorically. He has a dream. He's a Muslim. He's got no clue what this means. In the second dream, he walked out of the house, and everything outside was burning. It was a terrible scene. Chaos everywhere. Houses and everything were burning. In the distance, there was a green hill like a big rock that was untouched by the fire. He told his family, we need to go there. His family was not interested, but he still went. There on the hill was a person who gave him a cross and told him, God is waiting for us. In the third dream, there were messages that, messengers that came knocking on the door of his house. His family answered, but sent the messengers away. He came out of the house to look for the messengers. Then he woke up. That same day, he had the third dream. Later that morning, he went to work, and a few hours later, the two guys attending the discipleship school walked in his bookstore and gave him a Bible. That's why he said, is this the book? Is this the thing the messengers were trying to deliver? The next day, Kenny and our team met with him to explain the gospel and speak to him about counting the cost. This Curtis Muslim, deeply convicted, convinced of the gospel, said, what must I do to have this salvation now? Who is behind those dreams? Certainly the Bible talks about God speaking in dreams. Who is behind those dreams? Who did this dream, these dreams connect him with? Bible believers, former Muslims who are, who are Bible believers, love Jesus. So when they share the gospel with him, notice they don't just tell him the gospel, but because they're, they're former Muslims, they know the cost. They explain the cost. This is what it's going to cost to follow Jesus. He wants to have that salvation. Friends, this is happening day and night around the world. If we, if we just sat here and gave you examples that we knew firsthand and from, from colleagues firsthand, we'd spend the rest of our lives, the rest of our lives just doing broadcasts with testimonies. And I can absolutely categorically back from Scripture that these things, healing, miracles, the supernatural workings of God in this way, should continue until Jesus returns. With all respect to those who differ, to me, it's a pretty much black and white case. I know I plan to do some major debates on this, but to me, I'm just saying it's one of these things. When I tried to be a cessationist, when I tried to deny the gifts and power of the Spirit for today, when I made an effort to, the, the word was just too clear, in the late 70s, early 80s, dur during my PhD studies, I, I could not get away from the clear testimony of the Word of God. So I, I've been addressing these things more recently just because they've come up more because the cessation this movie and buzz about it later this year, and then the roundtable discussion for American Gospel and episodes for American Gospel. So it's just coming up more, coming my way, and I'm responding. But I want you to understand this. For those who think you're angry or frustrated or defensive, I'm enjoying the blessing of God. Just Sunday morning before preaching, as we were worshiping and the beautiful presence of God was there, I was thinking about people that have told me, well, you don't experience the presence like that. We just go by what's written in Scripture. I was just thinking, oh, I want them to experience everything God has. I'm blessed. I want others to be blessed. That's my heart. We'll be right back.
Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. I really enjoy being physical. It's something I've just always loved, but I've definitely had times where it's really crippled me up. Being a horse trainer can be pretty physically demanding with all the duties that I have, not just riding horses for a living, saddling horses, caring for the horses. I feel like no playa just took the edge off and then it's it's continued to keep me from getting sore. No playa, it's been a huge blessing. Now there's a solution by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random double-blind placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints and an overall improvement in the quality of life. It's fun to be on the golf course again. I'm able to swing the club freely. Hopefully I'm hitting better golf shots. No play has allowed me to get back on the golf course, enjoy the game that I love, and maybe even give me that little edge to beat my friends at the game. No Palea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of Nopalea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Okay, announcement number two. I said I had three for you. So the sequel, Seize the Moment, had a few of the Fathers of Revival from Revival of Reformation Book One that came out early this year. And now the sequel to that. So that was the beginning. Now the sequel, Turn the Tide, How to Ignite a Cultural Awakening. I really felt grace in writing this with step by step. If God's moving in the church, how do we move from that into impacting the culture, changing the world around us? How does that happen? What are steps we can take that are practical through the gospel? So turn the tide. How do we ignite a cultural awakening? It is, oh, about 220 something pages. You can order your pre-ordered signed copy. So you'll get it in advance, pre-ordered signed copy numbered so it's kind of a collector's item you can do that going to the line of fire.org click on shop and you'll see it right on the home page the line of fire.org click on shop and you'll see it right on the home page you can get multiple copies we sign them for each person that you ask us to it's it's a great way to get the book out and, and we push these forward when a new book comes out and i i am really stoked about this one okay so i last week i had some fun i and just looking at comments received and likes, it seems like 90% of you got what we were doing. But I decided to have some fun with those who just, the only criteria for judging me is not what we've done in ministry over the decades, but did I call this one out or call that one out? Of course, everybody has a different list. I get all the lists. I got blasted last week for defending John MacArthur, okay? Then I have someone else wanting me to call him out as a false teacher. I, want, I have people wanting me to call Justin Peters out as a wolf. And then, of course, this one's been a call out Kenneth Copeland. This one's been a call out Todd White. This one's been a call out this one. That. So everyone's got their own list, okay? So I said, hey, I, I address issues over the years, always have. I address people privately, call people out. Uh, when things come to my attention, I'm burdened, and, and the Lord wants me to deal with it. We deal with it, but we've got a ton of other stuff we do in ministry. So I just had a little fun and said, hey, for all the critics, we're, w tell me all the Jewish ministry you're doing, because that's important. And go, oh, we don't have time for that. Tell me what you're doing in world missions going overseas. Well, we don't have time for that. Tell me what you're doing with the culture wars and, and oh, we don't have time for that. So I said, it's funny that, that they have their own calling, but I have to follow their. So I was, I was just having fun. Most everybody got it. It's like, well, you're just boasting. I don't feel like I've done anything. I feel like I'm every day. I'm just getting started. Generally, I don't feel like I've done anything. I'm, I'm eager. To, I, I know God's worked and I've seen him work and do amazing things, but I, I just want to honor Jesus. I, I feel like I'm just getting started, okay? But I, we, we, we pulled some comments, so I, I just, 
I want to share, these were some of the responses to the videos or, or related videos. This one is from a fellow named John, and we can throw the slides up if you want, guys. Uh, I've read his books, met him, talked with him. His theology is the equivalent of the Fire Nation from Avatar, Last Airbender, LOL. I'm sorry I didn't see Avatar, and I don't know what Fire Nation or Last Airbender is, but <laughs> that's, I was a, that was a funny one. Okay, this is from Peter. Mike, I don't believe you're in the position to issue challenges. Anyone can get a book published anymore. I assume you've read Jimmy White's factorial fictions on Ro or Ron Hubbard. No, I haven't. Again, there must be a line. Mike, it appears you're getting agitated by the number of people calling you out. Stop using your callings and excuse for pantheology. <laughs> I'm, so I'm sorry to laugh, but the I don't get agitated. I get, I get blessed when I get attacked for doing good. Trust me, I get blessed when I get attacked, lied about, misrepresented. I have colleagues that send me stuff to encourage me. Here's the latest video attacking me, the latest article, the latest website. Here's a book written against me. I'm, I'm honored that people are taking the time to attack. And where there's valid criticism, I'll grow from it and learn. I want to become more like Jesus. But I'm not getting agitated. Oh, and by the way, no, no, the books I've published, you can't just get published. Sorry about that. No, you don't just get an academic commentary published or other things. But okay, let's go on. Uh, this was Scrappy. Wow. This shed lights on why you don't expose those that mislead the flock. Be the, f um, let's see, because the flock connects you with them and they buy the wolves merchandise. So why not yours as well? Since you're always defending them. Just wondering, are you as rich as they? Somebody asked me about my net worth uh, because I, someone sent me something. I found it online that my net worth was $24 million. And I said, they said, what's your actual net worth? I said, when it gets to a million, I'll tell you. But, I mean, these things, do people actually believe this? Do they actually believe it? And, by the way, there's not a wolf on the planet I defend, but there are some people that others are sure are going to hell. And I said, no, I believe the person's a brother, but their theology is very wrong, or this is wrong, or that's wrong. But I believe they're a brother because I don't damn them to hell. Therefore, I'm, I'm making merchandise on, the, on, on what the wolves sell. Wow. You know, I... The thing that, that I don't laugh about is I hurt for people who actually believe this nonsense. What kind of world are they living in? That, that's what grieves me. All right, let's, let's see this one. Um, you, sir, are a terrible shepherd. You couldn't protect the flock with a tank. Foolish. Okay, how about this one? Dr. Brown, I see your echo chamber approves of your blackwashing of people who have your salvation at heart and try to warn you. Just remember, you are also being judged for your false witness against these men. So, you know, it's funny. Each group has their, their echo chamber. I try to interact with people outside of my echo chamber day and night, day and night. It's costly. It's, it's time consuming. It's often not fruitful. But hey, we got to make the effort. Got to reach out and make the effort and try to interact when we can. And, and, Thankfully, over the years, we've seen many, many people come around and have a change of heart. But the, the idea that my salvation is at stake, I mean, think of how deceived and messed up people are in their thinking, that my salvation is at stake, even though I love the Lord with all my heart, serve him with joy, now in the Lord for over 52 years. I've had the privilege of taking his message around the world again and again and seeing Jesus mightily glorified. But because... You brand someone a false teacher, and I do not say I know that they're going to hell, that my own salvation is at risk. What kind of God do you serve, friends? What kind of Bible are you reading? And do you even have the slightest clue of who I am and some others are? Wow. Jacob, if you had the same convictions for charismatic charlatans and false prophets, you could be used of the Lord. Unfortunately, you are being used by Satan by not judging what comes out of their mouths in the same in the name of God. So this happened to be a video where I, I challenged charismatic leaders Steve Schultz and Johnny Enlow last week about some anti-Semitic junks they were pouring out. Oh, but that's not enough. That's not enough because I didn't call out this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Some people are so incredibly myopic, and, and I'm trying to help you get out of that. Yes, we confront error. I confront error day and night. I write whole books critiquing issues in my own camp. 
maybe I should spend more of my time calling out the, the error of cessationism. Maybe I should spend more of my time calling out the destructive work that critics are doing and the lack of love and the hypocrisy. If they're going to come from their camp and attack mine, well, maybe I'll spend my time, I'll follow their example and spend my time just attacking theirs. Both, both are equally grievous. I listed uh, all the ways that hypercharismatics do damage last week and all the ways that, that hypercritics do damage. It's massive on both sides. Oh, let's see this one. Uh, Miranda, this video was a response from a place of deep hurt. I would unfortunately not call it a friendly challenge. Oh, you don't have the slightest clue. You do not have the slightest clue of what makes me tick, Miranda. I feel so bad for you. I mean, you, you seem genuine in saying that. But it's not out of hurt. I mean, we, we were laughing and rejoicing, our whole team. And, 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 and thankfully, as comments were pouring in, almost everybody was getting it. But some who, I, 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 it's hard for me to figure it out. What it is, and I'm trying to better understand this hypercritical mentality that is always finding what's wrong and always finding the error and itself is always right and, and, and is a million times more likely to see the speck in your eye than the log in its own by God's grace, I want to get to the root of that and help people get free from that so we can judge rightly. Oh, well, let's see another one here. Um, the debate has revealed to me that Brown has no credibility when he possesses neither the discernment nor common sense to call out clear hucksters and charlers in the charismatic movement, then nothing else he says can be taken at face value. I was extremely, it was extremely eye-open. I have a ton of respect. I lost a ton of respect for Michael Brown and Sam Storms these guys are defending the indefensible. I gave Brown the benefit of the doubt for years, but I don't trust his judgment anymore, etc. And then, yes, yeah, someone responded rightly to him. Uh, these were easy calls to make, and he blew it. Todd White? Are you kidding me? Sid Roth? Really? If you can't discern the obvious, how can you discern anything? You embarrassed yourself, Dr. Brown. You know, tell you what, here's what I've had the benefit of doing. I've had the benefit of knowing Sid Roth for over 40 years. I've had the benefit of ministering side by side with him. I've had the benefit of knowing people that have walked very closely to him for years. And there's not a financial scandal associated with him. There's not a sexual scandal associated with him. And he'd tell you, hey, I don't agree with ultimately all the guests I've had on my own show. But if you read the Bible, will you expect something supernatural or not? And for Todd White, I've had the opportunity to spend a good number of hours with him in private fellowship and receive texts from him as he's pouring out his heart and love for Jesus and love for the word. And as he's so excited to tell me about someone that God healed. And I've been with him when he prayed for a stranger and had prayed over them with prophetic accuracy and heard testimonies of people that Jesus healed through him. So no, I'm not going to call him a wolf. And I'm not going to call Sid a charlatan. Whether I agree with everything they teach or preach or not, whether I agree with every guest on a TV show or every guest that I have on my show, that's a secondary issue. But if you're going to judge my spirituality by whether I call a brother or sister a child of the devil, you're, you are so far off, it's hard to even describe it. Hey, if you're not getting my Frontline Newsletter, announcement number three, if you're not getting my Frontline Newsletter, it will edify you, bless you. Go to thelineoffire.org. On the homepage, hit subscribe.